a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Toya Wilcox Toya Ann Wilcox is an English singer and actress. In a career spanning more than 30 years, Wilcox has had eight top 40 singles, released, over 20 albums, written two books, appeared in over 40 stage plays and 10 feature films, and voiced and presented numerous television shows. Between 1977 and 1983 she fronted the band Toya, before embarking on a solo career in the mid-1980s. Her biggest hits include, It's a Mystery, Thunder in the Mountains, and, I Want to Be Free. Childhood and Early Life Wilcox was born in Kings Heath, Birmingham. Her father Beric Wilcox ran a successful joinery business and owned three factories. Her mother Barbara Joy, née Rollinson, was a professional dancer with whom he fell in love after seeing her on stage in Western Supermare, with Flanagan and Allen, and married in 1949. Barbara had to give up her career after giving birth to Nicola and Kim. Wilcox sold a sister, and brother, respectively. Asked why her parents might have called her so. Wilcox said in a 1981 interview, I don't know, they won't tell me. But it's definitely my birth name. There is a town in Texas, called Toya, and Toya in Red Indian means water. My parents deny that's where they got it from. Wilcox was born with a twisted spine, clawed feet, a clubbed right foot, one leg two inches shorter than the other, and no hip sockets. Because of this she endured years of painful operations and physiotherapy. Her physical condition was a cause of difficult times, at school. When I was bullied at school, it was cause of my character. I was a weak child. I was incredibly small. I had a speech impediment. I was the perfect bait for bullying. My dad took me out the back and taught how to punch the hell out of someone and, from then on I was never bullied again, Wilcox recalled. Years later she described her relationship with her mother as complicated, saying she hasn't hugged her mother since she was 12 and can't see it ever happening. However, later she gave much credit to her parents. I've never gone hungry. I never suffered lack of money in any way. Not because of my parents, anyway. They wanted the best for me. Like all parents do for their children. They wanted me to have a very good education, to be a polite child to be taught good manners and have a future, she recalled in 1980. Wilcox remembered that until aged seven she was very close to her mother, if only for being very ill and having to be taught how to walk and talk. Then Barbara had another child, a daughter called Fleur, who died. When she came home from hospital there was a bit of a distance between us. It was never talked about again, Wilcox remembered. At the launch of her autobiography in 2000, the singer said, We had a very violent relationship together. I was the violent person, and I didn't want her to kind of suffer by the book and I hope I represented her very well. Cause she really was a wonderful woman with a child, from hell. In another interview of the time, Wilcox said, My mother taught me how to walk. She was one that was trained to give me the physiotherapy to straighten my own spine so twice a day we would go through this routine. So she was disciplinarian in my life, from a very well right from when I can remember. So it was natural she was the first person I should rebel against, and I regret that our relationship was very often violent. And, now, I feel very strongly towards my mum that she sacrificed everything to give me the freedom I have today. Wilcox attended a private girls' school where she was noted for absence from the classroom and for setting off alarm clocks during a speech by a visiting MP, future Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, suffering from dyslexia, which, by her own admission, turned her into an angry, rebellious teenager. She achieved just one O-level pass in music. The ambition to sing and act started at about nine. I was an incredible dreamer when I was at school. I just felt trapped. I wanted to escape, really, she remembered. This had to do also with her upbringing which she described as, very strict. As a teenager, obsessed with aliens and the concept of alienation, Wilcox felt she could not fit in with anything. I loathed suburbia, I loathed the idea of getting married and having kids. I just thought, where the hell do I belong? She recalled. In 1974 Wilcox started to exercise her rebel instincts in experimenting with hair. I just looked like something off another planet. And I was very very lonely. No one would come near me. 
Buses wouldn't pick me up. Boys wouldn't come near me, she remembered. From early childhood, Wilcox was aware she did not fit into gender stereotypes. In an all-girls school she was always a tomboy, very aggressive and physical, frequently in fights. In 2003 Wilcox remembered. The rebellion came easy since most of my life up until I was a teenager I had to play a gender role. I didn't like to be a female, and I didn't like to be a boy either. I just wanted to be a person and I was acutely aware of this very early on in life, about the age of four, I loathed dolls, I loathed dresses, everything that had to do with femininity I couldn't bear. And it was forced on me, with such passion that I thought, if I don't fight it I'm gonna be stuck with it for the rest of my life. As a teenager she became uncertain about her sexuality even more. I went out with guys first when I was about 13 to 15 and then I just stopped. I never actually went out with a woman or anything. I generally thought I was a lesbian purely cause I wasn't interested in men, but, at the same time I wasn't interested in women. And that's why I concentrated so hard on my career from such an early age, she recalled. As her band started to establish a reputation, the singer felt put off by the groupie scene. All I ever see of women, usually, is groupies. They disgust me. How they can jump into bed with someone they've just met is beyond me. I just don't understand. There's no brain there as far as I'm concerned. I can put up with them. As soon as they get to me they change. They want to talk to you rather than pull your body. But as soon as I see them pulling, I just leave the room. I don't want to be associated with it at all. The band used to go out pulling every night and I just choose to go back to the hotel. I wouldn't go anywhere with them, she told Paul Morley in a 1980 interview. In the mid-1970s, as the punk movement began to gain ground, Wilcox saw something she might belong to, even if she understood little about punk politics. When punk started, I think it was very much about socialism, the Labour Party, the right of the workers, the right to be heard. I saw it on a slightly different level no matter who you are, if you had an idea. Then you could be part of the punk movement. I was slightly more simplistic in how I viewed it. It was a kind of emotional rebellion rather than a cultural rebellion. A friend suggested that she should see the Sex Pistols. It wasn't that I saw Sex Pistols and thought, oh, that changed my life. I saw them and my reaction was, I can do better, I go to London to do it. From then on I knew I didn't have to behave in a social norm, because I wasn't alone. By the time she formed her first band, Wilcox was already an aspiring young actress. Acting career After her O-levels Wilcox left school at about 17 and went straight to old representative drama school in Birmingham. Already, by then I was known in Birmingham for being the oddball that walked around with dyed hair. And you've got to remember that this is pre-punk. This was about 1973-74, she later recalled. While in drama school she had to pay her fees, because she was the one of her year who didn't get a grant. I worked in all the theatres in Birmingham so I'd go to drama school from 10 to 5. Then I'd go to the Alex Theatre or the Hippodrome Theatre and I'd dress the stars who were on tour, she recalled. All of those stars without exception, including Judy Geeson, Simon Williams, and Sylvia Sims, took a liking to her. By this time she was known in the theatre clique as the Bird of Paradise. After one year at the old rep, 18-year-old Wilcox had done some extra work at a BBC Pebble Mill TV station. A month later, director and playwright Tony Bycat was looking for a girl to play the leading role in the BBC Second City Firsts play Glitter. One day apparently in a peak of despair Tony Bycat went to the wardrobe department in Pebble Mill and outpoured his woes and he said, I really don't know what to do, we start shooting in two weeks. And the wardrobe lady said, there's a girl in Birmingham you really have to see, because she's an oddball and she has brightly colored hair, and she's like no one else we've ever met and she does extra work. So Tony Bycat came to the theater school to see me, and he apparently made his mind up there and then was I was this girl. Wilcox got the part of Sue, a girl who sang with a band called Bilbo Baggins and was dreaming of appearing on top of the pops. In the course of the 30-minute play Wilcox performed two songs she had co-written, Floating Free, and Dream Maker. In a 1981 interview, having learned the play's footage had been wiped, 
Wilcox commented, It's the best thing they could have done with it, really. It was the first time I ever sung in public, and I was shaking like a leaf. And I was so fat, it was glitter, though, that launched Wilcox's career. It was seen by Kate Milligan and Maximilian Schell, who offered her work with the National Theatre in London, where she got the part of Emma in Tales from the Vienna Woods. So I got a phone call the following day saying come down to London and I went down to London with a carrier bag and never went back. Wilcox remembered. It was at this time that she formed a band, Toya. In the National Theatre Wilcox was known as The Animal, the nickname John Gielgud gave her after she and a friend discovered you could have a backwards wheelchair race, and she wheeled herself into John's private parts. In the summer of 1977, a National Theatre actor, Ian Charlson, thought that Wilcox was someone that his friend, film director Derek Jalman, should meet and took her to T on Tregunter Road in Fulham at Derek's flat. The director picked the script of what later proved to be a seminal punk epic jubilee, said. It's a punk movie and I don't know what we're going to call it. But it's fun, it's anarchic, and threw it on Wilcox's lap, saying, pick any part you want. So I picked Mad, because she had the most lines in the film. And Derek then said, of all the characters, if any have, to be cut, because of lack of money, it's going to be mad. Because she is superficial, she doesn't serve a purpose. And I said, how wonderfully anarchic, I still want it. Wilcox remembered. In a month's time he did have to cut mad from the film, but, seeing Wilcox greatly upset, gave up his fee on the film so that she could play the role she was craving for. After that Derek became like a surrogate father because he knew what it was like to go hungry and so did I. Wilcox recalled, later she cited Jarman as one of her greatest inspirations. Derek Jarman I just loved to death, because he had no compromise. We went hungry. When we made Jubilee, Derek literally had nothing to eat halfway through the film, he completely ran out of money. There was nothing in the coffers, and he just refused to sell out and have any form of advertising or any form of sponsorship. Everything offered to him might have diluted the message of the film he turned down. So his spirit I feel very fond of. He was a great man. Psychologically the filming was difficult. I'd never seen a nude person before. And there was this scene where I jump into bed with two brothers and get the lighter out and the first time we did it they had their clothes on and then we did the take and I jumped into bed and they had nothing on. I completely freaked out. I'd never seen a nude man before, she told Paul Morley in a 1980 interview. Wilcox continued to gain strong roles, notably, Monkey in 1979's The Who album inspired Quadrophenia, which boosted her reputation of a provocative and anti-establishment figure. Later she recalled the circumstances. Frank Rodham, the director, was thinking of casting Johnny Rotten in the lead role, and I went along and helped him audition by improvising with him and being a friend to him. Then the insurance people refused to insure the film with Lydon in it. So I thought, fuck, I've been chucked, because lydon has been chucked. And I went along to Frank and told him to give me the part of Monkey. And I think he was so taken aback I was quite rude that he gave me the part. Partly, because he couldn't think of anyone else to do it. Later she admitted of her awareness of it being a strong career move. I wouldn't have stayed otherwise. Getting up at five, catching pneumonia. I didn't have a day off. I had to keep going. There was this nurse with me the whole time. I really was very ill. But I realized the film was benefiting me. Wilcox said. Then the Sex Pistols started on their own film, The Great Rock and Roll Swindle, and, for a while, when Russ Meyer was due to direct, Wilcox was going to take part in the film. Then, her role fell through. Instead, she teamed up with Derek Jarman again to play Miranda in his innovative version of The Tempest, which won her a nomination as Best Newcomer at the 1980 Evening Standard Awards. Derek offered me Miranda which was the first time I've really ever experienced Shakespeare and was very frightened of doing it, but refused to give it up because I like a challenge. And that was the biggest challenge in my acting career yet, Wilcox recalled. Her wild child performance, described as naive and knowing, exotically puffed out her image, according to Paul Morley. I knew it would benefit my acting career within the acting world. Punk rock star Toya Wilcox doing Shakespeare. It had that sensationalist aspect about it. But not only has it benefited my acting career, it's opened up a new audience for me. Wilcox commented. In 1979, 
On London's Royal Court Theatre stage Wilcox played Sharon in Nigel Williams' Sugar and Spice, the play about, hate, despair and sexual derision, climaxing with an unsettling jab of physical violence. I was offered the part of Carol, who is the bird that ends up naked, and I instantly refused it. I just couldn't handle a part like that. I sent the script back, and was offered the part of Sharon, which I was quite happy to take. The nudity would freak me out. Completely, she explained in the 1980 NME interview. The part took six weeks to learn and still proved demanding, lots of words Wilcox muffled on stage. You get to the point where if you're not concentrating I find I'm talking a load of gibberish, because I'm missing certain words out, I'm not thinking about what I'm saying, and the cast are looking at me in horror. You do things like that cause Terry so many lines, you forget your talking sense, she explained. Still she insisted on having at least one stage play a year, merely as a mental stimulant. Cause it's training, really good training. Film can be so related and you don't have to concentrate so much. I just find it a good refresher course. It just makes you think, she told Zig Zag in 1980. Also in 1979 Wilcox appeared as Delula in Stephen Polyakov's American Days at the Eka, playing alongside Mel Smith, Anthony Scher and Phil Daniels and, the same year, opposite Catherine Hepburn in the made-for-television film The Corn is Green, directed by George Cuker. Wilcox remembered how she had to go and do an audition with 2,000 other hopefuls for the film after the Emlyn Williams book, I had bright pink hair at the time. And this is a period film. And my agent said, don't turn up with your red hair. So I borrowed a wig from the National Theatre and I turned up at Eaton Square where George Cuker, the film director, let me in and he introduced me to Catherine Hepburn. And apparently she saw my eyes and said to herself, this is the girl. So the next day I go along knowing I got the part, I get the big phone call saying I got the part, I thought, sod it, I'm not going to wear a wig, I'll just go with my red hair. And I walk in and George Cuca said, would you like to take your hat off? And my hair was quite short back then and it was it looked like feathers. And his face went ashen as to think, oh, what have done, this is absolutely terrible. And he brought in to see Catherine, and he said, Catherine, this girl has red hair. And she just grabbed me. And in three hours we read through the play, and she just had her fingers in my hair the whole of the reading. Catherine Hepburn just fell in love with me the first time I met her and I say that modestly, because she actually admitted she did. She loved my eyes, she said they were full of fire. Wilcox was saying in her 2000 interviews. Wilcox played Calamity Jane at the Shaftesbury Theatre and was a guest vocalist in the anniversary concert of the Rocky Horror Show at the Royal Court Theatre. She had many television roles, including series such as Quartermass and Minder. She starred opposite Laurence Olivier in The Ebony Tower, also appeared on Kavanaugh QC and Secret Diary of a Cool Girl. During the late 1980s and 1990s Wilcox forged ahead with a career as a stage performer. Notable credits include Trafford Tanzi, Corbarat, Three Men and a Horse, the UK tour of Arthur Smith's live bed show. In 1990 she played Costanza in the national tour of Amadeus. She has also appeared as a presenter of programs such as Songs of Praise, Holiday, and Good Sex Guide late as well as being a guest on several shows such as The Heaven and Earth Show, Through the Keyhole and Loose Women. In 1999 she took the lead in the children's television series Barmy and Boomerang. She also provided the voices for the children's television programs Teletubbies and Brum. She has also appeared in the reality television series I'm a Celebrity. Get me out of here. And I'm famous and frightened. In the 2000s Wilcox had a busy schedule with theatre commitments, including appearing on stage in London's West End performing the title role of Calamity Jane at the Shaftesbury Theatre in 2003. In June 2008 Wilcox appeared on Living with the Dead on Living to share her experiences living in her haunted home. On the 24th of July 2008 Wilcox appeared on UK if one s this morning to discuss her role as a vampire in rock musical Vampires Rock. Toya has also appeared in shows looking back on popular culture including the Amma Celebrity series, and various top 100 favorite shows. More recently, Wilcox played Queen Ivana and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs at the Lyceum in Sheffield for the 2009 Christmas season. In October 2009 she made a guest appearance in the BBC drama series Casualty. 
Wilcox has also been heard on radio including the 2002 BBC Radio 4 series The Further Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. She has also played the widow Fontaine in focus on the family radio theatre's version of Les Miserables. In December 2006 she joined the radio drama series Silver Street on the BBC Asian network as Siobhan Brady. In November 2017 she played Queen Elizabeth in a theatre adaptation of Derek Jarman's film Jubilee at Manchester Royal Exchange Theatre. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?